we're recording, you can get started when you're ready. The, um, it's February 28th, three o'clock, and uh, therefore I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting to order that is scheduled for today and welcome everybody and start with the usual reminder that pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 is extended. This meeting is being conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom by telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance of members of the public is permitted, but every effort is being made to ensure that public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. And I want to remind everybody that the meeting is being recorded. And with that, um, we have a quorum of the committee present. I think that the other two members, uh, one Bernie, I think said that he would not be able to be here at all. And Matt sent us an email saying that uh, he was uh, disrupted in his travel plans and was only getting on a plane about uh, an hour ago or less. And that if there's Wi-Fi on the plane, he would try and actually join us, but we can't count on that. <laughs> so uh, with that, I want to go to the rest of the committee and make sure that they can hear and can we confirm back to us that uh, we've we've heard them. So, um, Bob, I'm present. And Lynn, present. Anna, present. Kathy, I'm here. Felicia, here. Okay, so um, the group present does constitute a quorum, and. Uh, we have an important agenda and with the uncertainty about uh, other two members and, and I likelihood that one for sure is not gonna be able to join us. I think that we should uh, in, uh, get the meeting going. Um, there were three major, there were three substantive agenda items in addition to the very important public comment for today's meeting. One of the uh, ones that was on the agenda was written with words, if necessary, which is water and sewer regulations, because we had no idea what the council would do last night. But I don't think that there's any purpose in having that on the agenda. And the other two items are particularly important. So um, what I would propose to do, if it's agreeable to the rest of the committee, and let me know if you have reservations about that, is to um, ask Sean to um, give us the update he was going to provide on the FY24 budget projections, which I um, may um, supplement a little bit because there was a Mass Mutual Association Fiscal Policy Committee meeting this morning, and um, then um, go from uh, go from there to public comment, and um, spend the entire rest of the time, which I assume hope is most of the virtually all of the meeting, on the elementary school building project debt authorization issue. So. Um, seeing nobody who's uh, raising the hands and objecting. Um, let me uh, turn it over to Sean uh, about the update. Thanks, Andy. So um, most of the update's gonna be looking at the governor's budget that came out um, earlier this week with the local aid accounts and how that um, sorry, not the governor's budget. The governor's uh, released some of the local aid numbers from her budget proposal early um, so that we could start uh, moving forward with our planning. So I wanted to review those with the finance committee and um, I can highlight areas that will impact us specifically. And then if there's any questions, there'll be time for that. Um, so uh, 
let me know, is this large enough to see? Okay. So this is uh, an online application that the state puts out. It's where they post their cherry sheets and they've posted their preliminary uh, cherry sheet for FY24. And cherry sheet is just what it, the, it's the form where all the local aid, uh, it's what they've called it historically. And so what you see here is, are the revenues, uh, local aid coming into the town um, with what the number for FY23 was and then what is being proposed for FY24. And so this is a look at the entire state. So that's why it's very large numbers. Um, but one of the things I wanted to highlight is that there are some uh, local aid accounts that are getting large increases at the state level, uh, but that's not trickling down to us as a large increase. And you'll, I'll point out where that is. Um, so the big one is chapter 70. You'll see there's about a 10% increase from FY23 to the governor's proposal, um, 5.17 uh, billion up to 5.7 billion. Um, so that's a big increase and essentially is fully funding some of the promises that have been made in the past around um, funding uh, for education and across the state. Uh, charter tu tuition reimbursement is going down a little bit. I think Andy, you know, in talking with you a little bit, it sounded like that was related to lower charter school enrollment, not necessarily a reduction in uh, reimbursement levels. And then the last one I'll point out here um, is unrestricted general government aid or UGA. This is the money that comes into Amherst that can be used for any allowable government uh, governmental expenditure. Um, that is only getting a 2% increase um, at the overall level. So from here, you can drill down into any community, but we'll go to Amherst. So they take Amherst specific situation and they um, and the different formulas for allocating state aid, and then they produce an Amherst specific version of what we just looked at. So for Amherst, Chapter 70, remember there was a 10% increase globally to the Chapter 70 pot of money. Um, for Amherst, we're only getting about a half percent increase. And that's based on uh, what we think is $30 per uh, minimum aid per pupil um, in town. And that's because the Chapter 70 formula, um, it, it factors in uh, wealth and ability to pay and student demographics and so on. And so it, it um, allocates more resources to less wealthier districts. Um, based on the metrics that the state has built into the formula. So while there's a lot of new money going into chapter 70, there's not a lot of new money going into our specific school district. And I would say roughly two thirds of the school districts in the state are sort of in the same bucket as us, um, where you get minimum, where we're getting minimum aid uh, increases. Uh, charter tu tuition reimbursement staying pretty much flat. Um, unrestricted general government aid, we are getting about a 2% increase. So that's keeping pace with uh, uh, the, the uh, global allocation. Um, and we're getting a decent size increase in state-owned land. Again, we think the state-owned land methodology has some flaws to it um, based on how much we get versus some other communities in the state that have state-owned land. But in terms of a year-to-year increase, it's a pretty significant increase. Um, uh, from what we got in FY23. So all these numbers, uh, at some point, either the next meeting or the meeting after, we'll likely fold this into our projection, that uh, revenue and expenditure projection you all have seen, and bring it back to you. And at that point, we'll be able to confirm is 2.5% um, what we can do for operating budgets, can we do more? Um, do we still have a deficit that we have to close and, and anything else that's changed will fold into that projection. Kathy, I'm going to go over one more chair sheet, but do you want to ask while we're on this screen? Absolutely. Just keep going. Okay. Uh, um, the other one, only other one I wanted to go over is uh, the regional schools. They have their own cherry sheet because you know we do are connected uh, to regional schools through the Amherst Pelham Regional School District. Um, so regional schools, again, this is the global look. Um, there was a pretty decent size increase in regional school transportation, um, a large decrease in charter tuition reimbursement. And, and I think that's something that we'll have to pick apart more. That's a 30% reduction in the, in the 
funds allocated to it. So I don't know if that's fewer students at the charter school level. Again, this is global, not just Amherst. Um, but that, that one looks a little funny. But if we go to our specific school district, Amherst Pelham, uh, so what you'll see is again, chapter 70, they're getting a very modest increase, about $30 per pupil. Their charter tuition reimbursement's dropping significantly. And again, I don't know if that's a factor of something being off on that first, uh, that first page, the global number for charter tu tuition reimbursement, um, or if there's something real there. So I think we're gonna have to dig into that number to find out if that's just maybe a mistake. Um, and then regional transportation is getting a pretty big increase, which is nice. I think I read somewhere around 90% reimbursement for regional transportation costs. Um, so that would be a big boost for the regional schools. Uh, the other thing that's not shown here um, is that their, the governor's proposal uh, included a, a significant increase in vocational transportation reimbursement, something we do have quite a bit of because of Smith Vocational and Franklin Tech. Um, so uh, if we're able to get a really anything in reimbursement for vocational schools, that'll be a big increase for the regional uh, regional school budget as well. Um, so I think the one takeaway I'd say from this is we have to look at this charter tuition reimbursement number and just see what's going on because that's a large drop. Um, and the global number doesn't really make sense that it would drop by about $3 million um, from one year to the next. And so then Kathy, I think now's a good time for questions. Um you know, trying to absorb, as you said, you have no idea what's going on on the charter lines. So that's a biggie. And we do have, the council has a meeting coming up with our legislative representatives. So I don't know how much they went into the charter and fixed the formula at all. So it's, mm -hmm. it's just a question for, since you said you don't know what. So, uh, but I, when I looked at public libraries and schools, if what the governor's budget has done is bringing more money into certain areas of our own budget. Would we, and this is probably premature, would we put all of that money into those budgets? And that might produce not a two and a half, two and a half, two and a half across each of the budgets in terms of an increase because of this, the state money that's coming in. Um, so it's a question, and I know that since these numbers are literally just out, it's it's a difficult one to answer. Kathy, is your question, um, because we're getting some additional state aid, will that result in a bigger increase for operating budgets than 2.5%? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so I didn't, you, you said exactly what I was trying to ask, and you said it clearly, yes. <laughs> no, um, so I think, yeah, I think that's what, um, either at the next meeting or the meeting after, we're gonna take those numbers and we're gonna bring it back um, in that format that you're used to seeing where there's one page mm -hmm. on revenues, one page on expenses, and we're gonna fold that in and we're gonna update with our most um, sort of our final pension numbers and any other numbers that have moved a little bit. Um, the flip side of those revenues is there are some assessments as well that we pay for PBTA um, and charter school tuition. And so we'll put all the final governor numbers into that projection worksheet um, and then we'll be able to see if there's room to increase operating budgets um, to, a, to a higher percentage. And then my, my second question that's related to that, you know, say that the answer is yes, you know, on net, we think we're getting more revenues, but the revenues are particularly in the school area. Would that mean the schools might get 2.8%, you know, I mean, in other words, we've gone in with two and a half, two and a half for each. So you'll be coming back with that in terms of what it all looks like. Yeah, I think, so again, our, the way we have budgeted is sort of a, um, unless something is restricted for a particular type of use, we, the revenues that come to the town, we look at them collectively, and then we allocate a, a sort of uh, balanced percentage to all of our operating budgets. I think it's safe to say, well, maybe I won't say it, but the numbers that looked at first glance, it doesn't look like there's gonna be a lot of money coming in for schools um, okay. based on the getting the minimum per pupil aid. Um, it, UGA is increasing at a higher percentage, for example, which is the unrestricted general government aid. Um, so I don't know if that would actually um, okay. benefit them, but regardless, our approach has always been to take a balanced approach and, and support all of the operating budgets at an equal level. Okay, thank you. So I uh, was at the, as you know, I'm on, I'm a member of the 
Massachusetts Municipal Association Fiscal Policy Committee, which is uh, appointed by the uh, board on recommendation from the MMA staff and consists of 23 members who are distributed by their role within municipal government and geographically. And it's my privilege to be in my second year of service on the committee. We met this morning. The report um, on the uh, charter schools was that the reason that the reimbursement had decreased is because the number of students has decreased statewide in the uh, charter enrollment. I find the percentage somewhat astounding. However, if they level funded it, and it certainly does not explain our um, numbers, because I don't think that uh, the Amherst participation in uh, charter schools has decreased by that percentage. So that does merit some checking. Um, in my conclusion, when I first saw this cherry sheet last week, was that uh, this is going to make for a challenging year for budgeting. And the question of how challenging is what we're going to hear when we get our next report from Sean. But uh, state aid is the second largest portion of uh, funding for Amherst and most other municipalities. And uh, the 3% increase in unrestricted government aid uh, is our two percent? It's it's just not sufficient to get us to where we need to be in percentage of increase. It's under the it's under the two and a half percent um, of the uh, you know what we're looking for for overall in this bill. You know the assumption on the property tax. So it's going to be a challenging year when you put that together with the. Um, minimal increase to Chapter 70. Virtually all com uh, com all communities that are not receiving more money because of the Student Opportunity Act uh, are uh, sort of in the uh, same position because uh, any, any community that's not receiving additional money because of the Student Opportunity Act is getting the $30 per student. Um, and the last thing that I just want to observe about this morning's meeting is to the extent we did a round table of the, um, it was close to the full number of members were there and people who reported on their um, projections Everybody said it's going to be a very difficult year as a result of this, if this stands through the legislature in developing the budgets on a local level, for the same reason that I pointed out that uh, it's uh, the uh, unrestricted government aid number and the $30 per student number uh, is a problem. What I found most interesting was a report from um, a municipality that is a uh, recipient of uh, funds from the Student Opportunity Act. And they were predicting a big problem because uh, they were facing um, a need to increase the municipal contribution anyway, just to meet the minimum required contribution from their community into the schools and as a result, they saw that they were gonna have a problem funding anything other than education. Their education was taken care of well, but every other segment of the municipal government of that community was gonna uh, be uh, in, in under extreme pressure because of what was happening. So when, um, Putting all of that together, um, I think that we just need to, all of us, um, recognize that um, as uh, Paul works to give us a budget on uh, May 1st, he's likely to be under a lot of pressure and that we should not assume 
that um, there's going to be funds to do much of anything um, additional, but that remains to be seen until Sean gives us a nice report. So if there, let me just see if there are any other questions. If not, I'm going to take a, uh, go to public comment and ask those members of the public who would like to speak on anything uh, related uh, to the Finance Committee does not have to be an item on today's agenda, uh, but uh, anything that uh, they would like to offer comment, is, please raise their hands. Sorry, Andy, I, I had another quick question. Okay, so I don't see any, so I'm going to just, just second on it, because uh, there's there, one. There is one. There is one, and uh, do you want me to bring um, yeah, Tony Cunningham into the Tony. room? Yeah, bring Tony in and let Hi, Tony. So, Tony, can um, if you could uh, just introduce yourself and uh, yeah, take about three minutes Hi. and. Um, Tell us what you want to share. Uh, is it my microphone working? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I can hear you. Okay, great. Having some problems with my headphones there. Um, Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. Uh, just a quick comment related to the motions about reserves. I am in support of both uh, motions. I think um, they're very creative solutions to trying to reduce the burden on taxpayers. And I appreciate Alicia Walker's efforts to contribute substantially from the reserves and also um, Kathy Shane's suggestion to use 5 million toward the sustainability measures. That seems like it could be more like an advance because if you end up getting those rebates later or the cash payments later, it would replace a lot of that 5 million. So I'm just uh, weighing in in support of both uh, motions to use reserves. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Seeing none, no other um, hands going up from uh, members of the public who are present. Um, I think that uh, it's back to uh, Anna who had uh, her hand up. Yeah, sorry, it took me a minute to formulate my question and um, I'll just, I can email it to, to Sean. It's just a request for when we actually get the budget of um, something that I'd love to see. So not important. Thanks. Okay. So then um, we need to um, get to the question today, which is the elementary school building project debt authorization. And um, of course the amount that we're gonna authorize uh, relates to, in the end, um, what may be, but not entirely, and um, others can explain this too, is to, um, it's what will be on the, uh, what the amount of, would be the effect of the debt exclusion. But um, So I, I don't know if Paul, if you or Sean have any introductory um, observations that you'd like to share with the committee? Um, uh, nothing specific, but I just want to point out, we did send out the memo um, addressing uh, the various questions that were raised at the previous couple of finance committee meetings. And so, um, you know, we tried to expand a little bit on specifically the use of reserves and some of the considerations that the this committee might want to have when you have that conversation. Um, and happy to answer any additional questions that maybe were generated from those responses. Do you think it would be helpful to expand on any of your answers or just point them out, the ones that are, um, did you think significantly affect the question at hand today? Uh, sure. Um, let me share my screen real quick. Um, so, I think number three specifically relates to the conversation today. Uh, so how would a $1 million reduction 
and the amount of debt to be repaid from the debt exclusion impact the average single family household. So we went with a million so that you can extrapolate, you know, whether it's 1 million, 2 million, 3 million. Um, but roughly it is $9 um, off the, uh, the impact for the average single family household. So, um, so if the impact was 478, that would reduce the impact down to 469. Um, so you can use nine dollars as sort of that that metric for um, when you have your conversation later. Uh, we included the, uh, what else is in here, and then I think probably the only other one is number eight. So uh, there was a question about how uh, the debt exclusion impacts related to the four building project model and planning, and how using reserves might impact that. So I think the only thing I'll say here is just uh, as of right now, the planning was to build up our capital stabilization fund to hopefully uh, pay for the fire station in four or five, six years without having to incur debt, save the interest and also um, uh, move that project forward at a, at a quicker rate than if we wait for capacity within our capital fund or our capital uh, allocation in the operating budget each year. So if we, Anything you take out of capital stabilization will obviously impact our ability to build up that fund uh, to the level it needs to be, which we estimate around 20 million um, to to achieve that goal of of building the fire station without incurring debt. And I think the only other thing I'll say is we did, um, you know, this has been a conversation for a little while about using reserves for some of the sustainability components of the project, um, and what do we do with what do we do with the energy related tax credit payments that come back, not only for for this project, but just in general, the town does spend quite a bit on um, energy efficiency projects. Um, and, and I imagine we will continue, especially as we have other building projects coming up. Uh, so what do we do with that? And I think we want this committee to consider should those go into the capital stabilization fund. And from there, they can be appropriated to do a range of things, whether it be reduce the cost, um, the cost of, the, of a building project, um, you know, support the capital that year. So there's not as much that needs to be um, funded through debt. Um, but we think that would be a logical place for these credits that come back would be to go into that capital stabilization fund because you, in, in most cases, the initial funds that will uh, allow us to get the tax credits are gonna be capital funds. Uh, so it makes sense that there's a rebate that those would go back into capital. And I think I'll stop there. So, uh, Kathy has a question, so. Uh, it's a question comment, and I don't want to delay the rest of the discussion, but, but I very much like Sean's um, suggestion that he just very quickly went over. Um, and so I'd like to consider the Finance Committee making a motion to recommend that to the council and to the town that, um, you know, as these tax credits for capital expenses for solar or ground source, they also have them for electric buses, as, as these become real, you know, I mean, they're on the books, we just haven't, nobody's got them yet, um, that they go into a capitalization, stabilization fund. And just so people know, we've got in Joint Capital Planning Committee, we we're looking at some expenditures that I think could qualify for Crocker. We've got some for the old school up in the north in North Amherst, and this is like changing out from a, a oil furnace to a, a mini split. Um, so there there are some pieces there, and needless to say, there's a two or three law firms that are standing by to help towns figure out how to get this money. You know, it's it's like like everyone's saying, how is this going to work? What are the guidelines um, that we shouldn't all recreate the wheel so we can figure out who's out there. But I like the idea of it going directly into a stabilization fund, so recouping those expenses. Um, that's my comment and strong endorsement of that concept. So we had two suggestions of motions, and I think it might make sense if it's agreeable to the committee. And again, I will look if anybody doesn't agree, please um, just raise your hand or speak up. But to ask Kathy and then Alicia to briefly explain their motions, 
not necessarily to make the motion now, but it'd be good to um, have motions explained and have an opportunity to just informally talk about each of them uh, in sequence and then um, see what information we might be asking before a, a motion is actually offered. If there's anybody who doesn't agree with that, um, there's a next step, please let me know. Kathy. My, my only is, is I'd rather have, I would like Alicia to go first. Not start with me, but start with her. Okay. Um, I mean, we we almost were at her last time, so I just would like to give her the opportunity uh, to start. Okay, if there's no nobody's uh, saying otherwise or raising their hand to say otherwise, then I'll see Alicia. Would you be willing to uh, make a brief presentation for Kathy? Um, hi, yes, thank you, Andy. I just have a quick clarification question. So am I presenting my motion now, like reading my reasoning behind why I am presenting this motion or do you want me to just read what my motion is? Cause you said brief and my no, explanation no, is not very brief. Yeah, no, I, I uh, don't need to, you know, proceed as it makes sense. I was, what I was trying to do was uh, avoid getting a motion and having to be discussing a motion, but to get the proposal out before the committee with an explanation and opportunity to discuss both of them and then what other alternatives uh, might come forward out of that discussion and then go back and, and try and move to motions but allow some discussion first. So if you'd like to start by telling us about your motion and what your thinking is behind it, uh, in either by reading or by just telling us uh, in, in words that you come up with now, it's up to you. Um, okay, but it, can I just make my motion now? I, I'm not sure if I'm quite understanding the... I guess that. I was trying to. Um, I, I thought it might be helpful for the committee to talk about the motions before we have to deal with the mass motions on the floor. Well, I think I, well, I thought the process was that like I make the motion and then when I have a second that opens discussion. No, I think I'm just, I'm not really quite understanding well, I why a, I can't I was just trying to, my motion. So I was trying to uh, suggest that we, uh, try and have discussion generally about the topic because I think that one thing that has to come forward and it will come either way but it might be a little bit more um, free-flowing if it's not strictly done around the motions yet but I'll leave it to you to decide. Yeah I think if I can just make my motion now. I would prefer to just make my motion um, and then have the discussion there afterward. Um, <clears throat> so um, I can read the motion, which is that I move that the finance committee recommend that the town manage the town council requests the town manager include use of $10 million of capital reserves in the funding plan for the elementary school building project. So a motion has been made, and I'll have to, you know, have to see if there's a second. Lynn? I'm seconding for the sake of discussion. Okay, so there's a motion that's been made and seconded. And um, want to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you, um, Andy. Um, so I did include a short memo in the packet. I hope you all um, had some time to take a look at it. I know it wasn't included until yesterday, um, but there are three uh, main points of rationale that I would like to speak to very quickly and please bear with me because I'm sick and my voice is kind of going away, <clears throat> but um, I will do the best I can. 
Um, so the first um, reason that I want to go over is that we have sufficient reserves available. Um, our current total reserves are approximately 24 million in all of the accounts. It's almost about 10 million in the new capital reserve account. Using the 10 million would still leave 14 million in reserves, which is 16% of operating revenues. Um, in general, I think the recommendation is that we have between five and 15% in operating revenues at all times. So this keeps us within our targeted range. Neighboring towns have lower reserves between four and 9% with the same AA rating as Amherst. And so if we're looking um, at the plan that Sean has presented to us, we aren't anticipating the next capital project to come forward for a few years. And that this allows us enough time to work on increasing reserves before the next construction project is ready. Um, and so I just wanted to make that distinction in the difference between Kathy's motion and my motion, because I think there was a comment at the last meeting that said, you know, it, one motion might prevent the other motion from moving forward. And that's not how I'm looking at this. I think they complement each other um, and would be both smart investments for our town. Um, the second rationale is that it would provide significant relief for individuals and families. Um, and so lowering the debt exclusion override from 55 million to 45 million represents 18% lower impact to individuals and families. 40 million <clears throat> would be, sorry, 27% less. That is a substantial to our residents, particularly those who are not able to afford this and the other tax increases and upcoming fee increases. It equals about 90, $235 a year in a decrease in the amount that we will be asking our residents to pay. Um, and I want you all to remember that this tax increase for the school project is in addition to the usual 2.5% annual increase plus higher water, sewer, and electrical rates. Um, according to the 2019 American Community Survey, there are around 2,139 families in Amherst who live below the poverty line. That is 10% of all families. And the rate is even higher for families who are single family head of household at 17%, <clears throat> multiracial families at 15%, and Black families at 21%. I've heard this project be touted as a social justice project because of the high percentage of minority and low income youth that are enrolled in our school system. According to DESE in this current school year, 37% of our elementary school students come from low income families. We are discussing the funding of a school building for an estimated 575 students where a large portion of those students currently live in poverty. And I just wanna talk about what that means for a minute. By definition, poverty is not having enough money to meet basic needs, including food, clothing, and shelter. By definition, 37% of the youth in this community on a daily basis do not have access to enough money to pay for food, clothing, and shelter. A majority of these children are on the free and reduced lunch program, meaning that their caretakers cannot, feed, cannot afford to feed their families on a regular basis. And we are sitting here as elected officials representing the needs of our community in discussion to bring forward a project that will raise the taxes beyond the regular 2.5% for the next 30 years as if it is an insignificant small task. Maybe for people who have enough privilege to measure the increase in the absence of a morning coffee or latte, but this is not the reality for many of our residents. Without a substantial amount of relief for these residents, this is not a social justice project. And so let's not forget that social justice doesn't solely encompass education and the physical spaces in which students are educated. It is also about economic equity and accessibility. I have lived in Amherst since 1993, and I have seen low-income families come and go over the years due to expenses in this town, mostly related to housing and housing instability. And so I wonder who we are building this school for. These are the same economic disparities 
and discriminatory practices that have been causing our enrollment to decline over the years. The third reason is that the reserves were built for this purpose. The town has been building these reserves for years with the purpose of using them on the major capital projects. And it's time to take up on that promise. The school is the only project we know will be ready for these funds right now. And this project and the residents in our town, in our community are deserving of this initiative. Our town urgently needs a new elementary school building and our residents need to be able to continue to live in this town. And so I present this to you all today with the hopes that our town leadership will make this commitment and show up for our, our entire community. And thank you. I want to now invite comments and questions. Anna? Sure. Thanks. Um, thank you, Alicia, for, for presenting that. One of the things that is my sort of half-formed thought and my many post-its in front of me, is, as y'all know, that seems to be my current strategy for better or for worse is post-it questions. Um, and I, I guess it's for Sean. So we, the last time that we got a presentation about the four pro building projects, which was included in your memo, um, you had given estimated costs of 20 million for fire, 30 million for public, public works. Um, is that still roughly true? I have 17 follow-ups, but that's the first one. Um, I would say those are allocations that we've set aside for those projects. We haven't uh, gotten detailed cost estimates for either of them. Um, but would you say are... that they're still conservative estimates? I'm assuming they were. I would say with the construction industry the way it is, we're gonna have to make difficult choices on, on what we can include in those buildings and what we can't, um, you... especially given the net zero elements. We've increased them from where they were originally. You may remember the DPW yeah. originally was 20 million and the fire station I think was originally 15 million. Um, so we've increased them significantly from where we started. Um, but given where the construction industry has been, I don't want to ever, at this point, I'm not going to say anything is safe, <laughs> given what we've seen with uh, bid openings and and just the market. So um, have we seen projects be constructed uh, for those amounts in, in the recent years? Yes. Um, does that mean three, four years ago, or three or four years from now? Um, there won't be changes that we need to make to those numbers. I, I can't say that right now. We might have to look at it again. Yeah, that's fair. And and the reason I'm saying that is because, you know, we were looking at, if you look at that plan in your memo, you had mentioned option three. Oh, the tabs, the tabs, I have too many tabs. Um, you had mentioned option three. Model three was kind of the one that would be most likely, um, which is 20 million of reserve usage, uh, correct? So, yeah. yep. okay. Um, and then 3 million of other capital funding, assuming that those prices aren't aren't gonna haven't skyrocketed, which that feels like a really bad assumption to make. Right. Um, you know, I think that my my concern with funding this amount or higher from reserves is that it forces delay. It I can't figure out the math to not have it force a delay in the other projects in some way or force us to borrow more for those projects, which I don't even know if that's a possibility that we want to look into. Um, Right, Sean, because that would be using reserves so that we didn't have to borrow is the, the idea for fire. Yeah, because of a construction cost where we increased the, the cost of the project. So again, we increased the fire station, for example, up to 20 million um, and then increasing our interest rates, uh, you know, two years ago or a year and a half ago, interest rates were around 2% or less. Um, mm -hmm. Now they're in the 4% range. Um, so yeah, the ability to borrow for all these projects has gone away. We've sort of we had a really great window where we could, if we could have done all the projects in a two-year span, it would have been ideal. Um, yeah. But we've sort of passed that window. So, so this is kind of this is really the root of my concern, right? Is that we have a DPW that is just I, I don't actually have words to describe our DPW building anymore. It's so um, shameful in my in my opinion, and we really need to move on that. And you know, and and same fires is, is brutal. That building is not not going to continue to work. It doesn't, it doesn't currently work. So for me, I'm really concerned. I recognize that the, the impact, um, 
I recognize that this impact on taxpayers is significant. I'm, uh, I, I will feel this personally. Um, and at the same time, I'd also really like fire trucks to be able to come to my house and, and have a station where our fire, our, um, you know, our, our, um, firefighters are able to do their work and same with DPW. I mean, thinking about the, the trucks that were out there today, we need to be able to house those in a, in a safe and functional facility. Um, and I'm concerned that taking the amount from the reserves, um, that's this high really does limit our capacity and our ability to do those other really crucial projects. And we're kind of borrowing from the future and, and that's not gonna, it's not gonna work. We've seen how things are escalating and, and I'm really concerned about that. So that's my, this is, those are my post-it comments for now and I'll try to get them a little more cohesive in a moment. But those are my initial thoughts, I guess is my, my point. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Um, Lynn? You want to Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank Alicia for bringing this forward. This is not just Alicia's discussion. This is a discussion that's happening all over town. People are looking at our various funds and saying, why can't we take this from reserves? And so, Alicia, I, I just want to thank you for your heartfelt comments and for representing that voice in our town that is asking this very same question. So, um, it, and therefore it needs to be discussed. Anna has raised the two big projects that are on the books, but I'm gonna raise a couple others. And this is me coming from my district. I think if I send one more email to Paul Bachman about the condition of the roads in district two, he's going to shut me off because that's all I'm hearing is about roads. And yet each year right now, we're only putting about 2 million plus into roads for a $29 million bill that we're looking at. So there's big projects and then there's and those cover various parts of town and cover various age groups of people. And in many ways also represent social justice. Getting to the hospital is social justice. Having somebody come to your house and help when somebody's fallen is social justice. I really, really have to say, we have other questions being raised, other demands being raised for our capital projects, in addition to the ones that are, quote, on the books, there's, you know, the ongoing idea of BIPOC-led youth center. There's the ongoing demand for a new senior center. And if we, at this point, make the decision to dip into our reserves at for the school, we then have to just kiss those others goodbye. And I, those are tough choices. And we knew we were going to come to these tough choices at some point in our town. And we are there. So I, again, just totally thank Alicia for bringing this forward. She's one of many people who say, let's just spend it on this. But if we spend it on this, then when we need to do the fire station, we're going to have to go out for another debt exclusion override because we won't have the money. So I'm feeling caught like everybody else is. But I'm not sure that this is the way to solve that problem. Andy, Andy, you're muted. Yeah, you're muted. Andy, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. I had there was a lot of noise going on in my background, which is I forgot I had shut it off. Um, let me let's call up Alicia because her hand is up, and then uh, 
we'll see if another member won't speak otherwise. I have some thoughts about Alicia's initial presentation and where we're at. Alicia? Yes, thank you. If I can just really quickly respond to some of the things that have been said. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so I want to make very clear my support for moving forward the DPW and the fire station. Um, I had the privilege or the opportunity of going on a tour of both buildings uh, very recently, and I have seen the conditions and I understand the, the urgency of those buildings. Um, and this initiative does not stop those other projects from happening. And so I want that to be very clear because it's I think that is an attempt to stop this motion to say then it stops other projects, but it actually does not. It just changes the way we have to think about funding the projects moving forward. Because this would pass does not mean then we do not get a fire station. That actually sounds really ridiculous. It just means we need to think differently about how we will fund and achieve and accomplish getting the fire station built in a timely manner. And people will continue to come to your house. Again, passing this motion doesn't mean people don't get ambulances and that is a threat to social justice. That was also a completely inappropriate comparison. People are getting medical care and receiving calls and responses from fire right now. That is not something that's going to stop if this motion passes. We are just going to need to think differently about how we are going to fund future projects. And that is the point is that they're future projects. This project is ready to go right now. And so we need to think about how we are going to make this happen right now. It is not a sufficient answer to say we're going to continue to look into possible funding sources for this project that is ready to go now. It is more reasonable to say that we will continue to look into funding options for projects that are not currently in front of us right this minute. And so since we're not even projecting the projects to come in front of us for a few years, we have a few years to come up with other options. This project, we do not have a few years. We are going out for the debt override on May 2nd. That is very soon. This is a very different, this is, it's just very different. And so I think this is not the time to pit projects against each other. These funds are not coming from the same project, the same pot that they would come from if we're going to fix the roads. This is not coming from the same pot if we are going to make a youth empowerment center. We're talking about the capital reserve fund for the capital projects. This is not something to pit projects against each other. I support all of those initiatives. And I hope that we can find ways to fund all of those initiatives. We're looking at something that is in front of us right now as moving forward. And I think it's a no brainer for me. I think the town needs to reevaluate its priorities and figure out how we're prioritizing our town and the people who live here and not putting those things off. Anna. Thanks. So I guess, Alicia, I'm open to being wrong about this, right? Like, I, I think what's what I'm not comfortable with is kind of saying, well, we don't need to know that right now, because we don't plan these huge capital projects on a year to year basis, we plan them looking out years and years ahead. And so, you know, I think that we've also been building the reserves for, I mean, I was just looking at the chart, I don't, I lost it in my tabs, but um, yeah, I mean, we've been we've been slowly building these reserves for years and years and years. And so I think my my concern is the idea of saying, well, we'll we'll figure it out like we and I'm, again, I'm not trying to say that flippantly at all. Um, I would love to be able to figure it out, but I'm really not comfortable without knowing what that plan is, because it's also not necessarily that far down the road that we'd be starting these projects. Right. This is the the timeline of of paying for things in local and municipalities is um comes up really quick is what i'm learning here so i think that for me i'm uh, i'm uh, i'm unclear on how that would happen and and i'd love to hear more because if it's possible then that's amazing but i don't see how it's it's doable and i and i don't see it as pitting projects against each other when it's the one fund that is supposed to pay for all of the projects right and we've got the models of how to do that it's really a matter of, you know, we pull the money from the debt exclusion now, or we have to do it again for a fire station or for a DPW, right? Like that, it's not like we're gonna get some huge, we're not gonna win the lottery as a town. Um, and so I think for me, like we've been building and building um, for the purpose of funding all four. And, and I'm, I'm very, I am concerned about depleting and, and limiting our ability to utilize those funds for all four as intended. 
Um, but I'm I'm open to hearing how. I'm just I'm I'm uncomfortable with the idea of we will figure that out down the road. Um, and I apologize if I'm paraphrasing that poorly. It's not intended to be that like that. Thanks. So I raised my hand because I at some point wanted to speak. And uh, first, I guess there are several points that I want to make. Yana started along one of the paths that I was thinking about. But um, you know, I've been involved in uh, this municipal finance question back from when I was first appointed to the original, to the old finance committee <clears throat> back um, around 2008, I believe it was, or approximately 2007. So, and uh, the, you know, we've been talking about a fire station to be DPW elementary schools. These are, these projects have all been there for a long period of time. And um, the, building of the reserves has been a slow process over all of that time. That was one of the strategies to address not one project, but four projects. And it was not something that could be done quickly because reserves were being built, not by allocating money to reserves in a budget, but by just taking advantage if there was excess revenue in a year or if there was uh, turnbacks of money that was allocated in the year and unspent. So it was uh, pieces of money on an annual basis over a long period of time that allowed us to build the reserves to that to the level that they're at now. Second thing uh, is that uh, reserves serve multiple purposes, not just, they weren't just built for the major projects. Um, and that was the, why the capital stabilization fund was split out, was to try and uh, at least enable us to better visualize uh, the various reasons. But question of roads and, is just another form of capital. And um, it is something that um, if we're going to accelerate the pace of road work, um, that um, is a capital decision that we have to make. Um, the uh, other reason to have reserves is that uh, there are good times and bad times in municipal government. Um, and we've gone into several rounds of recession and um, it was the reserves that it was the ability to keep going. And uh, as um uh, I observed at the beginning of the meeting where after Sean's report on uh, the projections for next year, we're entering a tough period. We don't know how long that tough period is going to be, but uh, we know that the economy is very uncertain. And so um, there was a large piece of the reserves that needs to be held for the rainy day fund use and not for uh, committing to expenditures. Uh, so both that and the length of time uh, that it takes to build funds, uh, I think are very much uh, things uh, that I would hope that this committee will consider. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to point out is that, yes, there's been an enrollment decline here, but there's been an enro enrollment decline in all communities, um, and not all of them are communities that have all of the attributes that um, Alicia so um, accurately described for Amherst. Um, it is uh, demographic changes that have driven the enrollment decline to a substantial amount. Um, and if it hadn't been for the number of uh, uh, students who have come into the community uh, who uh, and uh, um, have uh, come from outside and some of them have uh, been people who have changed the composition of school and I think the diversity of the school is a, is one of its strengths and uh, but uh, 
the whole decline, you know, the whole decline in enrollment uh, is really due to demographic cha changes in birth rates and the aging of the population as a whole. And uh, it's, that's a universal, regardless of the nature of the community. So I, I um, am, a, am somewhat concerned about the fact that it um, is important both to maintain uh, our reserves for the variety of purposes and not put it out for a single purpose all at one time. And that we really need to recognize that uh, once spent, given the fact that we may be turning into a, a longer term trough in the economics, that it may be a long time before we ever rebuild the reserves to the level that they're at, uh, uh, that will be sufficient to continue on with the projects if we don't think of all four projects as being urgent and needing a path forward um, right now. So those are my comments and I guess it's back to Alicia. Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> um, I appreciate everyone's comments and concerns. I had a couple that I wanted um, to respond to. Um, and I guess just really quickly first, Andy, because just I understand the demographic changes. Um, the enrollment decline is due to demographic changes, but de demographic changes are driven by what? Usually economic factors. And so all of these things are still very deeply tied together and all of these things are influencing and impacting each other. Um, and then just another response to some of the things that Anna brought up um, in terms of wanting to know right now, how will we be able to fund the projects that are projected? And that's why we work on these things ahead of time. Um, I also definitely understand that. And that's where my concern comes from is how come we don't know right now how we're going to be helping our residents when this project is here and we have been planning it for years. Doesn't make any sense to me why we have not planned ahead, why we have not used this time. And I brought this up when we were talking about the timing for the debt exclusion override. I asked if, you know, Sean and Paul thought they had enough time between now and May to come up with remedies, possible remedies for residents. Like why have these things not been in the making for years? It is the same question and the same concern on the other flip side, flip end of it. And I know we're entering a tough period as a town. I understand that. And I am asking you all to understand that residents live in this tough period in this town. They do not need to enter a tough period. They are already there. And these changes that we have authority over can completely change their lives. We have the ability as town leaders to be innovative and to be finding ways and solutions to address these problems instead of just continuously putting them off. We have time before the next projects. I know we like to have more time to implement solutions. And so then I asked why we didn't find more time to implement this solution, but now we're here and we don't have a lot of time and we don't have a lot of options. We have more time and therefore we can find more options for other projects. And so while I really hear and understand all of these concerns and I didn't completely neglect them when I am presenting this motion, all of these things were in my head because again, I also am very much in support of the fire station and very much in support of the DPW and finding new places and building new buildings for those, for those things as well. But I think it has come to a time that each of us as counselors really need to evaluate our priorities when it comes to the service that we are providing for this town. And it is like very much showing to me right now. Okay. Anything else that somebody from the committee would like to offer? Sean or Paul, do you have anything from the staff perspective that you'd like to offer? See the uh, Lennon. Uh, I'll leave that to Paul if you want to. Okay. I defer to the finance committee members first. Uh, Lynn? Uh, please go to Kathy first. 
Um, Kathy, then. So, um, Andy, I don't know how you want to do it with a motion on the floor, but um, it may be useful for me to talk about why I talked about five million um, in this context, rather than talking about the larger amount. So, um, I am. I don't want to change the flow of this, but so that is just a question. Go ahead. So there are two different possible ways of using some part of reserves that are before you. Um, I'm not going to speak very much to mine other than to say that it's five million and I never thought of it being additive. Um, I whether five is the right number, what I was looking for is a initially um, softening, moderating the impact, um, thinking that the tax credits for solar and geothermal, and as I said earlier, uh, you know, I have to do a best guess. Solar's a little bit easier because I know exactly what the cost of solar is, so I can get the up to 30% of it. But no one right now knows when we say geothermal, is it the whole system or is it just the pumps, the wells, um, what part of it? So I don't know what base number to use as an estimate. So I, th I thought of it as a way of paying back reserves quickly. So it wasn't taking reserves and not having them be available because these are in theory, once the building is open, they're very similar to the Eversource incentives where we, we expect to get the Eversource incentives when the building opens. And then there's one more part of them that we get if we hit the energy target. So there's another 200,000 that's the end of the first year. So it pre is this. Um, alternatively, I could see that if we're committed to using those tax credits and Sean can figure out how to finance the school in a way that we can prepay, uh, two to three to $4 million of the debt that we've incurred. So it's me pulling down the debt so we have less to finance over a period of time. And I thought of it as a package that we have Community, Community Preservation Act, we have Eversource, we have reserves with a target of getting most of them back is, is how I came up with my number. It wasn't um, to pull it completely out. When I look at the modeling, for the two buildings and I the tour of DPW is an eye opener uh, for anyone who hasn't done it it's not just an old building but the building is falling apart um, and you can see it and I'm not an engineer so I can just see it with my bare eyes it's a little bit like when I watch the back of my barn come off no longer attached to the barn I could see that I need better do something about it before the roof came down so you know what I don't know is is when those can actually happen. We still, uh, with DPW, I think we have to build on its current site. And I would like to have that building feel more real to me rather than somewhere out in the future. But I pegged my number much lower because of all of this, you know, on a quick payback to reserves rather than a pulling money out of reserves. Um, and I will just stop there with the rationale, it's, it's written in my piece. So whether it was five million or four, and I thought the optics of it makes sense. It's a package. I watched the way the Joan Library packaged them. They have some, maybe not real historic credits. These are real credits that are out there on the federal books where I checked with the McGovern staff. I mean, if we had built last year, we could be applying for them this year because they, they went on the books in January and, towns are eligible to come in for them. Um, so, so that is my, my lower number. The rationale was building up from a range of what I thought we could get in credits, not to pull out reserves that are for the other two big buildings, because I think we need them. And I'll stop. Yes, Lynn? Um, I want to ask Paul and Sean a question or two. Uh, and that is part of it's a statement to tell me, am I correct? When we start the construction of this building, we start borrowing money 
like anybody would for a construction project, okay? And when we finish the project, we convert that to a long-term borrow. Is that the way the borrowing works? Generally, that's how it works. Um, so if we spend a million dollars in FY25, we would want to have a temporary borrowing, um, which is called a bond anticipation note. We would want to have a bond anticipation note for a million dollars for that same fiscal year so that we have the revenue to match with the expenses. Um, we would do that for every year while the project is being constructed. And at the end, we would combine all those bond anticipation notes into one large bond uh, that would then become the basis that we'd repay uh, the project. The only reason I say generally is, um, again, if for whatever reason, interest rates are super low in the first couple of years while the project is going on, where we might want to take advantage of a permanent borrowing earlier, uh, we would have the ability to consider that. So um, again, interest rates have you know, risen rapidly lately, that's, which has made our, our challenge bigger. Um, but if they were to come down as rapidly at a, at a key time for this project, we might want to bond um, as many costs as we can at that point to take advantage of that lower interest rate. Thank you. Um, if we received money because of credits, I assume things like the systems we're receiving the money for would have to be up and running. And I say this because when my husband and I put solar in, we had to show that it was up and running before the federal government would give us our very nice tax return. Yeah, no, that's completely correct. When this is not at the at the beginning, it's at the end. The building is open and you spent the money. Yes. Part of where I'm going is as we move along, if additional money becomes available, even maybe in the form of a gift, okay? We can take that off of the bond. Is that correct? The final bond, the final cost. We would wanna do it before we bond it. Um, yeah. So when we have temporary borrowings, we can always pay, the, pay as much off as we want because um, those, those are only for one year at a time, those temporary borrowings. Um, once we do a permanent bond, I believe there's a period of time where you can't pay it down because again, uh, banks bid on that and it's, you know, they, they're expecting a certain amount of interest based on their bid. Um, and so again, if we were to get a large, uh, some sort of donation or another funding source or something like that, we'd want it to be before we go out for that permanent borrowing. Okay. Um, or if we knew it was coming and we had a pretty good assurance, for instance, for the uh, energy saving measures. Right. We might do that as a separate borrowing mm -hmm. instead of wrapping it into the big borrow. Right. Yep. Um, now, I'm asking this for a reason. Okay. And now I'm going to go back in history. We have been planning. We've been planning for years. I chaired a committee that made a report to town meeting in 2006. Andy, you weren't even on the finance committee yet. Stood in front of town meeting and said, here's your options for a fire station. Then the economy sank. I chaired another committee about DPW and fire station. That one finished up in 2018. And the cost has gone up and up and up. And during that time, we looked at another school and the cost has gone up and up. We have been planning for these four major capital projects for almost 20 years. And in this year alone, the cost keeps going up and we don't have any control. And even now we're sitting here saying, okay, We've submitted something to MSBA, great job committee. By the time we actually go out for bid, will the cost go up? Will MSBA give us as much money as we hope? We don't know. But what I will tell you is working with our legislators, we already got an increase from MSBA just this year. 
in the square footage reimbursement. By talking to Eversource, we're estimating a 1.2. By going to CPA, we've gotten money there. We've been looking and trying to turn over every stone to find the pot of gold to help pay for the school. And we've been doing the same thing for the library. And we've been doing the same thing, looking down the road for fire stations and DPWs by having legislators that we work with submit bills about funding other public projects. And every time we bring in more money, the cost just keeps going up. And so we've seen a fiscal plan at the beginning of my term on the council where we could do all of these projects in a period of five or six years. And now we're looking at, we're lucky if we can do them in 10 or 15, and I'm not hearing a conversation about DPW. I'm just hearing maybe we can put through the fire. So I don't want, I don't want to sound like the old person in the room, but I will tell you, not only have we been planning for this by accumulating reserves, but we have been working hard to get as much other funding in as possible. And in some cases, we've had little successes here and there, but that doesn't mean we stop. So I'm very concerned about this coming year's operating budget and the following year. I'm very concerned about this project and whether or not we're still looking at the final cost or whether we're gonna to have to go into our reserves just to cover something we didn't anticipate. So we talk about reserves as if it's, you know, spend it today and refresh it tomorrow. But what I'm pointing out is a scenario where what was our reserve and our plan was going to allow us to do four buildings, no longer is allowing us to even comfortably say we can do four buildings. So even in that period, the picture has changed. Thank you. Anna? Uh, I think Alicia might be responding to Lynn's comment. So if she wants to go next, I'm happy to switch spots. No, it's okay, Anna. It's not going to be. Oh, okay, thanks. So I, I think I'm trying to trying to look at the look at the numbers and kind of think back and looking at Kathy's proposal, it looks like the school could be eligible or is eligible for somewhere between 5.4 and 6 million back. Um, and so I'm I'm not comfortable combining the two. I'm, I know I'm not comfortable combining the two and saying 15. I'm curious about, um, and Kathy, I'm curious if you've come across this in any of your travels, um, what possible credits there might be for our other buildings that are that we'd like to build, um, recognizing that it still it still might mean financing if it's if it's something like a credit once it's complete, that still might mean financing it and getting a credit after. But um, I'm curious if you know of, and I was trying to do a quick search, but I couldn't couldn't do it uh, or couldn't get a, an answer right away. Um, if it would make sense to do the 10, knowing that at least 5.4, if not six would come back. So ultimately the hit to the reserves would be four. And then if there would be a way to seek those credits for the other buildings that we're hoping to build as well. I'm not sure if this makes sense. Yeah, Kathy, I'm, I'm hoping you've got some. Okay, first, um, I'll have to look at the memo I sent because I think you're on the high side. Uh, it's, a, it's an up to 30% um, on it. Um, so, and the variation I have is if it was at the low end, um, it would be in the 2 million range and at the higher end, it would be nearer to four. And it's just, it's again, it's what, That's my bad. I added them. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I, it's two to four. You know, you know so just, I just want to correct that. And so the, the code, just so everyone, these are 
odd because nobody's been eligible for them. We're not a tax paying entity, right? So what is on the books, and I sent a description on of it, is that it's a direct payment to an otherwise tax exempt entity for up to 30%. And there's a slight dis there's a discount if we finance it with municipal debt that's um, tax free. So right. you get quite as much back, but you also get a bonus if you somehow know you've bought the steel locally. It's been done in the United States. So it applies to all a full range on a, of um, someone is taking it's taking the oil burner out and bringing in a or a you know a, a heat pump in um, of some variety. Um, there is some for charging stations. There's definitely some for storage. And so there's a list of what qualifies. This is federal. And what we don't know is whether the state, and it's one of my questions for our legislators, the, the state doesn't have anything on the books like this, although it's been talked about for a while, to um, do an incentive to help you pay. The state has a program that helps pay after you've done something and all gives you a little extra check. <laughs> um, so that's where we we don't know yet. Um, and I know Ch Stephanie Ciccarello, our sustainability person, but in several towns, everybody is looking for, okay, it looks like, and some of it is if you spent it last year, you could get the credit, this direct payment this year. So it went on the books. So it's goes forward. And, and there's a variation on how many megawatts you're buying. And we're well under that. So we're in the place that it's easier to compute. So, so that's all. So I just didn't want you to exaggerate my numbers. No, I appreciate, I appreciate the check. That, that's super helpful. I think I had been looking because the, the information that you had included from the Aspen Institute was specifically for schools. And so um, I was curious what, how it translated for other municipal buildings and if there was an opportunity for us to seek similar credits for these other buildings to offset potential reserve use. They, they wrote it so school, because they're the K through 12 group. Yes, no, I understand. Think, think of it as any public building. Um, this is you know a tax exempt church that wanted that's tax exempt that wanted to convert its oil furnaces. I mean, it, it's opened up a major incentive program that- Absolutely. That um, so it's they wrote it just for schools should know about this because yeah. public schools have never thought that they were eligible for anything from the federal government that wasn't requesting a grant. So that's the big yeah. difference here. You don't have to ask for it. Um, you can just fill out some kind of weird tax form <laughs> because you're not a taxable entity. Um, so so those yeah. guidelines aren't there yet. So, you know, that's why I want to be really careful just to say that. That, that it's been confirmed, they're on the books, and the, the guidance from IRS isn't out yet. Okay, thank you. So I think where where I'm going with this is, I'm curious, Sean, I, I know that's kind of a weird wrench to throw in this, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts about whether, you know, how much we'd have to kind of make back into reserves to not be damaging these, these other projects. Is there any sort of hit that, or any flexibility and how much can the credits make up that room? I guess is, I don't, I'm not sure if that makes sense. And then second, and if not, I'm happy to try to keep talking and see if it clarifies itself. Um, but then the second point is, like Kathy said, these are new. And so my, um, I, I am really excited about Kathy's motion and what I would want to add in some way and some commitment is um, dedicated staff time to pursuing these credits. I think that that would be something that's going to be critical for us is to know that these are it's now part of someone's responsibility to a realm of responsibility to be to be chasing these down um, because like Kathy said they are there we just have to get them um, it's not necessarily and it's not like the application and we have to be selected uh, as the lucky recipients it's it's just a matter of can we follow through as a town on getting these so I'm really excited about Kathy's um, and I'd like to know kind of where's the how how much how high could we go in dipping into reserves, knowing that we maybe would get credits back in the future, if that makes sense? And I recognize credits are still taking from a project cost. But yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so so I don't have a a definitive answer for you. I think the goal was to get the capital stabilization fund to twenty million dollars. Um, so if we use 
all of it. That means we have to come up with $20 million. Um, it took you know, quite a few years to get it where it was. Um, as Lynn and Andy pointed out, it's been, it's been years building up the reserve. So do I think there's lots of potential with the tax credits payments? Yes, I think, um, as Kathy pointed out, it seems like it's available for all municipal buildings, um, the DPW, the fire station, it, those are going to be net zero buildings as well. So they should have significant costs associated with that component that might be eligible. And we also, we spend quite a bit on energy efficiency measures just generally, um, you know, whether it's pursuing charging stations or electric school buses or, um, you know, replacing our, our gas burning heating systems with electric systems. Um, so there's, there's lots of potential there. I think the big thing is we haven't done it yet. We haven't seen anybody get it. Um, we don't know if there's going to be anything like annual limits on how much, you know, a town can get, um, you know, I know with, with this, uh, like a personal solar, there's, there's a limit sort of on how much credit you can get and you've got to carry some forward. And so we, we haven't seen the, the rules, um, the, the IRS rules around how this will all work. So leaning on the side of being conservative, we're not, we're not going to project that until we see those rules, which hopefully will be out. I mean, they got to come out soon as, you, as Kathy pointed out, the, um, there's gonna be some municipalities that are going to be seeking them pretty soon. Um, so th there's a lot of potential there, but until we see the IRS rules and know how, you know, how the eligibility criteria will work and, and how much, um, you know, what, what's counted, what's not counted, um, I won't be able to answer that question. Thank you. Alicia. Um, thank you, Andy. Um, so I respect and understand the enormous amount of planning that has gone into the financing and the figuring out of the capital projects and how we will see them to fruition that Lynn was referencing. My, my reference was in response to what the town has done to plan to support the residents through this possible tax increase through the debt override, which we have anticipated, not the projects itself. I know that there has been a lot of planning that has gone into those projects. Part of that planning, however, has been the creation um, of these funds to support the projects. And one of those funds is the school project that is in front of us today, the funds. These funds were created for literally this exact reason. They were not created to be committed to one or specific projects. They were created for to support all of the projects in general. And so that's why, again, I think it is completely appropriate to be using these funds for this purpose. Um, I, I did wanna say a few things about Kathy's motion, but I also am feeling deeply troubled by the fact that my motion is on the floor and there has been a huge effort to talk about everything besides my motion and my intentions of helping low income residents. And I feel like the discussion has gone astray from that purpose, um, which is deeply troubling to me. Um, but since it has gone all over and it has been allowed to go, go all over, I will talk to Kathy's motion in that I support the credits going back um, into these funds. I know that's not part of the motion that she made, but she did speak to that. And I think that that sounds great and that if these funds that would be used for Kathy's motion are then being replaced, it becomes a non-factor. And so I'm not understanding why we would not be supporting one, why we would say we can only support one motion and not the other if those funds are going to be replaced. We aren't even, we're not going to see the impact of using them in the end. And so why we are not still willing to commit some of the funds which were saved and compiled for this exact reason to help offset the impact on families and individuals who are financially hurting. I have heard a lot of discussion about the town's financial constraints and everyone is continuing to stray away from talking about the financial hardships and burdens that are experienced on a daily basis by the residents that live in this town right now before even raising anything. And so I would hope that if we're all just going to vote no, we can just go to the vote rather than continuing to avoid talking about the exact purpose of my motion. But I think that this discussion has gotten a little bit carried away. Yes, uh, thank you, Alicia. I realized that it has, but that was 
kind of what I anticipated was going to happen, regardless of whether we had a motion on the floor or not, because we both knew that there were two motions out there. And that uh, we either are going to take them sequentially or kind of discuss them together. We ended up doing, discussing them together, even though there, you are correct, there's a motion on the floor, and I'm going to move to it quickly. Uh, I think, you know, as, as I look over the number of years that I've been involved in this process since, uh, you know, its inception and <clears throat> more recently during the council years, because the, uh, you know, uh, Sean took over and presenting the model from his predecessor, Sandy Pooler, uh, about the same time as the council uh, became the form of government in the first council was appointed. And so we've been talking about this for a while, and I think that we all recognize and have for many years before that, back into the select board town meeting days, that uh, we were very conscious of the impact of taxes in a very high tax community, which is high tax because of um, decisions that were made that uh, it kept commercial development from um, helping to balance out residential development over over time. Uh, and what we tried to do was to avoid seeking an override of two and a half in order uh, and to try and live within those limits and still build up the um, reserves that we have. Because and we, I think we also knew that eventually the debt exclusion was going to be a necessity, and the, the school was going to be the biggest project, and that that's where the most logical place, therefore, for a debt exclusion was going to happen. So I, 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 you know, I feel like we have been for a long period of time done the best we can under very difficult circumstances of trying to maintain. Uh, the uh, level that we, uh, uh, the lowest level possible in asks of our residents, knowing that this was coming. But I don't think that we can avoid it, avoid that uh, reality now. I also want to point out that uh, the efforts that Lynn talked about that have been um, successful in trying to control the amount of the cost so that we could control the amount of the ask from voters has been um, also a concerted effort for the same purpose. So those are my concluding comments. And if there are no others, then I think we do need to um, come to a vote on the motion that has uh, been put on the floor and seconded. Uh, so I'll give staff one last chance. If they have anything to say, look to see if there are any hands that go up from, I think Sean is something. Yeah, I'll just say at a high, uh, the general level, we need to get these buildings built. I think that's the, the number one thing when we look back at the last 30 years, um, building projects have come up and they haven't been, uh, uh, built for whatever reason, they've been kicked down the road. And that's why we have this really large challenge in front of us. And so the most important thing I think all of us can do is we got to start getting these things um, built and and then get them off of our queue because there's going to be other buildings that are going to be coming up right behind them in the next 20 or 30 years. And if we haven't cleared this, uh, this batch, then we're going to have, you know, that much greater of a challenge. Okay, so uh, seeing no other hands going up in the committee, uh, keeping an eye out and don't see any, I think we do need to uh, come to a, come to a vote and on the motion that is on the floor, which is Alicia's motion, and um, there's no request to um, have. Her or somebody else read the motion again. I think we'll just go to a vote. I think we all know what the motion is. So I'm just going to um, 
go alphabetically. So uh, by last name, so Anna. No. Lynn. Regrettably, no. Uh, Bob. I don't support. Matt is absent and uh, obviously was unable to join us. Bernie is absent and had told us in advance he'd be absent. Kathy? You need to unmute, Kathy. No, because I think it's too high. And I'm going to um, also, for the same reasons, but no. And Alicia? Yes. So the motion fails one in favor, four opposed, one resident member not in support, and two resident members absent. So I think I need to turn it over to Kathy to make a motion. If she wants. Um, just one thing about the wording of my motion. Um, Alicia got guidance from Athena that we couldn't just say use of reserves. We have to recommend that the town manager propose to us the use of reserves. So Andy's, mine is not worded in that way. Um, if you want to put mine up on the screen, I didn't, I didn't get any guidance. I just wrote it. So I, I don't want to have a motion that's got wording that, that wouldn't be the way we would normal. So I had it that we, we were recommending allocating 5 million um, contingent on a positive vote. And then my intention, you know, and as I think someone pointed out, my intention was that all the tax credits that were be got would be go back in. So it was a replenishment on my explanation. So I'm not sure my motion is as well worded as, as it should be. Um, and I, so I, 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 you know, I'm, this was drafted a, a week ago as I, I as I thought about pulling this amount of money and I came up with the five because as Anna pointed out, um, I could get fairly close to that amount of money and with um, tax credits if I assumed the higher level for geothermal. And the other thing, Lynn, when you were talking about how we finance it, I thought maybe we can have one is a short-term bond so that we're paying off the bond right away, you know, that, that we were using the tax credit. So it wasn't a prepaying a long-term bond. So I had behind my thinking was a way of financing this that we, the reserves stayed whole. So I'd be happy to rework this to an up to 5 million, you know, assuming that this would be offset by tax credits, which is what my intention was with this. It wasn't to just pull down reserves. It's, I just need guidance on it. So um, Kathy, um, I have to recommend the town council request the town manager allocate up to 5 million of the capital reserve to fund the new elementary school building to support initial costs of geothermal and photovoltaic systems contingent on a positive vote for the school project on May 2. Does that sound right to you? Yes, and can we put at the end and that as um, an anticipation of uh, federal credits, the credits would replenish deserve, reserves? No, Lynn, you're saying no, you can't expand it that much. Just keep stop it, there. Keep it clean. Okay. So so Athena just rewrote my wording for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> if that's okay, I can read it again to make sure you're okay with it, Kathy. Yeah, no, I'm fine to it. I'm fine to it. And the up to five. So if people understand what my intention is here, that's all. Okay. I see Bob's hand is up. Yeah, I, I just wanted to... Um... I don't think we can put this in the motion, but it, if if we pass this and it goes to the council and is passed, I think the instructions to the town manager 
should be that we should not allocate more than we actually get back in tax credits, or we can reasonably assume we're going to get back in tax credits or in credits. In other words, I don't. I, I we shouldn't be over optimistic about how much we can get back. I mean, we're going to get back what we get back, and that's going to reduce the cost, right? And and Bob, I'm comfortable with that as as the instructions. You know, it, as I said, I'm 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 doing my. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we, we don't, unlike the Eversource incentives where they give us a precise number for you did this many wells, you get this much credit for it. <laughs> and then you hit this number, you get this much more. We, we don't have that yet. So I'm comfortable with that is the intent. Kathy, Kathy are you making that motion? The up to language, yes. it helps. Yeah, the yeah. up to. I think the up to is fine. I just think it would be helpful to have instructions to the town manager that are more explicit. And, and Lynn, seemed to, Lynn seemed to indicate there wasn't an easy way to do that in the same motion, but but this I don't see we, how we can this, do it. This discussion clearly is giving those instructions, so we can write that in the finance report, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. And I don't know. I mean, the other thing I was going to ask. Uh, Athena and Lynn's opinion on this, whether we could also uh, do second, do an additional motion afterwards to cover other topics, because we're trying to avoid listing two topics in the same motion. That's, I always prefer separate motions. I, I would too. So that's, Lynn, so I think that, separating them, the second motion should be that tax credits go back into the stabilization fund, which would be fine with me. So I'm, I'm at, I'm not going to, I've said enough about the concept, so I'm done. So I, um, I am making that motion. <laughs> you are making the motion as Athena has suggested wording. I'll second and, that motion. As the suggest as the wording I, presented. So the motion has been made by Kathy is suggested with the edits suggested by Athena and has been seconded by Anna. So it's on the floor. And um, Kathy, I'm gonna offer you the opportunity to speak to the motion or um, otherwise. Uh, no, I, I, I waive that. I think I explained it and we had a good discussion of it. Okay, Alicia? Yeah, I just need some clarification as to exactly what the motion on the floor is. Like, did, were we editing it or were we, what is the motion? I the can motion read is, it. as Athena put it up, I, can you, uh, it is to recommend the town council request the town manager allocate up to $5 million of the capital reserve to fund the new elementary school building to support the initial costs of geothermal and photovoltaic systems contingent on a positive vote for the school project on May 2nd. So are we not including the language about um, the percentage of the refund. I was unsure about that decision. I, I, I think it was, we do, those were separated out, Alicia, as I understood, and we could come back with a second motion that as we receive those credits, they go back into the stabilization fund. That is what my understanding is too, that, um, advice was that it was two different subjects in the same motion and therefore it was inappropriate and it needed to be done as two separate motions. So, Bob? Yeah, I just wonder whether we, in the motion, we could should call up the capital stabilization fund, just to be precise. I think we call it the capital reserve fund. Um, just, okay. I, I think we all know what we're talking about, but thank you. That's, I, I, that's a good, good wording change. 
I accept. I don't know you agree. I do. Okay, so the motion has changed in wording. So, uh, any further discussion on the motion? Lucia, your hand is still up. I don't know if that means you still in the speaker. No, sorry. It's a lingering hand, but I'm still confused as to what the motion is. I'm so sorry. I'm having a hard time understanding and following. And there's not, I don't know, you said Athena has it on the screen, but I don't see anything. Yeah, I, um, I don't know if you I, have it put back. Are we okay with the motion? Lisa? Yes, thank you. That is helpful. Um, I would prefer, this is just my preference. I know this is Kathy's motion to just leave it at 5 million and not have. Alicia, you muted partway through your sentence, I think. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I would prefer to leave it at 5 million and not have it listed as the up to 5 million. It's I think that the reason that the up to, um, you can speak to it, Kathy. Yeah, I, I, Alicia, I changed it to reflect Bob's concern that we are as much as we can trying to match the credits we get back. So my, the intention was replacement. So if we only got $4 million back, for example, <laughs> it it wouldn't be five. So it, it's trying to, to match it so that we're not depleting it. And I was willing to make that uh, change. Um, I don't know whether we want to vote on this and then come back to my original, which was five, where five was my guesstimate. Um, so I, I was looking to gain votes on the committee for an idea that I know was not palatable when I first came up with it. Yeah. I get the reasoning for the up to five million, but I think in reality, the town manager, if you know, if he accepts the recommendation, he's gonna have to pick a number soon um, that he's gonna bring back to the council and you're gonna vote. And we're not gonna know what we're gonna get in credits for this project or other projects, you know, for potentially years. So um so I, so I kind of get I get Alicia's point of the up to in some so ways, maybe so more helpful. It's cleaner to, just saying five, and then we I, can. I think so. Yeah, just because because again, that gives the town manager specific guidance at, at the number you're. Uh, I'm comfortable you're, you're with five. If, okay. If you if you so want, take, if you need a if you need a hard to, number. Say up to out, up to is gone. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're agreeing, Tana. So um, the words up to have been eliminated from the motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then uh, we'll go um, alphabetically again, but go down one as we do during council meetings, which puts uh, Lynn as first. Aye. Bob. Support. Matt and Bernie are absent. Kathy? Yes. I will vote yes. Alicia? Yes, even though this is not enough. And I don't know. Yes. So the motion is five to zero with support of one resident member and two of the resident and voting members absent. So the, uh, I guess the next thing is, uh, is there an additional motion related to what is the overall proposal? Lynn has it. Lynn? Um, I recommend that the town council ask the town manager to that when in receipt of any tax credits for the elementary school building, 
that those be uh, placed back into the capital, uh, I wouldn't say reserves and that's not right. Stabilization. Stabilization, Stabilization. Stabilization. fund, thank you. Second. Second is Anna. Yes. Oh, or is it Kathy? Sorry, I don't know. No, no. Anna was. Okay. I have a quick. Okay. Comment. Okay, it's just writing. Um, so, Kathy. Okay, I have what I think is a friendly amendment, Lynn. If you say, for the elementary school building project or other such capital. Um, credits. So in, in Sean's memo, he he had a suggestion that if we're getting it back on a school bus, if we're getting it back on another building, that it's going back into the stabilization fund. And I like very much like that. Um, did you want to keep it just to the school is what I'm I, asking. I want to be clean with the school. Okay. Okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then I'll go ahead and go to a vote. So I have seen no requests uh, from watching the screen. So uh, same, same order, bumping down one, Bob. Support. Before uh, I sneeze. Okay, and Matt and Bernie again are absent. Kathy. Yes. I'm a yes, Alicia. Yes. Anna. Aye. And Lynn. Aye. So it's five to zero. One resident member in support and two resident members absent. So I think that there were the agenda item listed was elementary school project debt authorization and to get to that number of course we have to have an estimate of what's the amount that we need for uh, instruction and uh, the the arithmetic that follows. So I don't know. Uh, Sean and Paul, what that you have on that on the call and Lynn, because your hand is up. Go to Sean, please. Yeah, so I wouldn't change the, I don't think the number should change. Um, actually, the, we don't have the exact numbers yet. We're still waiting for those numbers to come from the MSBA. Um, in any case, even what was just a um, if if a five uh, five million dollars is appropriate from reserves, I still don't think we're going to change the overall project cost because it's still part of the total project budget. We just wouldn't fund it through debt. Um, we'd sell the authorization, but we wouldn't fund it that way. We'd be, we'd pull it out of a separate appropriation. So um, I think the total project cost is going to stay at the ninety eight million dollar number, and we're still waiting for a final uh, final figure from the MSBA on their grant share. So is uh, uh, the debt authorization recommendation would be 93? Um, I think it's 98 for the total um, for the total project cost. In, but the amount that we're anticipating you know, so the, the amount that we're anticipating coming from uh, the stabilization fund. Right. Um, you still generally have to appropriate the full project cost um, as part of one single vote for the MSBA. Um, what I would suggest is if you're thinking of voting on the language today, we may want to wait one more meeting um, because the MSBA is still fine tuning the reimbursement rate every year. They update their reimbursement rate, and I know they're in the process of doing that right now. Um, so it might make sense to wait one more meeting to this was the struggle with voting this before the MSBA board meeting is that we don't get a definitive number from them until April um, 26th. Uh, we think we'll get a good idea of the numbers ahead of time so that we can get those inserted into the, the vote language so you can vote something. 
um, but we don't have that definitive guidance yet from our from our project manager. Um, so I don't I think you should wait on voting. I think you could the language is worth reviewing, but I wouldn't vote the numbers, vote the authorization recommendation yet um, because we don't have the definitive numbers yet. And Andy, this doesn't come back to the council. The public forum on this is not until the 20th of March, and we don't vote on it until at the earliest April 3rd. So we have meetings between now and then to get to as firm a number as possible. Yeah, I, said, I mean, you may want to add it, Andy, to the next meeting agenda as of, um, in case we get that between now and then. I, um, we might have it by next week. Okay. I think that we've done as much as we can today. Do we have anything else? Go ahead and call on Kathy. Kathy. Okay. Uh, it's just a question. I mean, you all will figure this out between now and when we next meet. But I, what I'm remembering with Jones, um, we had a big number, and then we had a town share number. We had a this number and a that number, because you've also got underneath this the CPA seven hundred thousand dollars and the um, Eversource Sean. So you, you're the wizard at figuring out how that all, you know. And then, M, you know, our debt authorization MSBAs, the way they pay for theirs is it's a continuous payment as the um, eligible costs are incurred, is what I understand. So, yep. you know, they're it's not like a third at the beginning, a third in the middle, and a third yeah. at the end. Um, so you'll just have to figure out what it is they need us to vote on. <laughs> yeah, th their process is a little different than the MBLC. Um, they're they're a little more strict about the the language. So anything we bring to you, we'll, we have to make sure they approve it first. Otherwise, we'll be back in front of you again for a second time. So um, th they're definitely more strict in the way we structure um, the votes. Okay, that was my only point is that 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 underneath the 98 isn't that's not all the debt exclusion. There's a big chunk of money that's coming yeah. at. So thank you. Yeah. Of course, we need to make sure that the public understands the total package. So we have ballot language that doesn't even have a number in it. Um, Lynn. Yeah, this is actually pretty consistent with what you're all saying, and that is that we need to recognize that since we got the most recent estimates, the building committee cut about $5 million plus. Um, we, uh, MSB, um, Mass School Building Authority, um, upped the game, increasing us by about $3 million. We just talked about 5 million here. We just uh, also approved the CPA vote just last night. And we still have the credits out there. We're not done. We're just looking, just turning over every rock to find what we can. Because Leisha, I hear you. Thank you. So anything else to be said on the topic of the elementary school building project debt authorization. So, being done, I guess, under uh, topics not considered uh, 48 hours in, or not available to consider 48 hours in advance, is that a referral was made to this committee that the meeting last night or um, that has to do with uh, compensation for service on the town council. And uh, it requires a report back on the, uh, for the 1st of April. So I will add it to the agenda for the next meeting which was to do the audit presentation and still is the audit presentation, a discussion about uh, OPEB and status of OPEB. Those were the two items that were on the meeting plan. And this is uh, now added to the uh, agenda for that next meeting. Lynn? 
do you want to wait until the next meeting to ask for specific information that I think the town manager and the finance director may have to do a little homework on? Or do you want us to raise that now? Um, I guess if it's a brief informational questions, yes. I think that I don't want to have discussion on no. the topic itself because no. it was not a posted agenda item. I look to Athena to tell me if I'm going out of bounds in the two responses of saying yes to getting information, but no to discussion. And I think it's a good idea to hold off until the next meeting, considering there was some public interest in this topic at the council meeting last night, and we saw some emails. So I think in order to give the public the, the most amount of notice before the committee begins discussion, including questions, it would be best to hold off. You'd hold off on the entire discussion, including posing questions? I think questions might be okay, but it's it's just a slippery slope to get into a discussion. Okay, uh, Sean? Athena, would it be okay if counselors just sent questions to Andy and then Andy distributed them to Paul and I? Absolutely. Um, that might be the most efficient way to do it, is just have questions sent to you, Andy. That's exactly what I was going to ask. Sorry, it's, sorry, Kathy. No, no, but it's the same as when we do the budgets. Um, we've been, someone gets schools and they send the, the questions through. So if we could do that and and I'm just, I think you're just doing fact information finding, right? Yeah. Correct. Thank you. Okay, so we will do that. And uh, I'll make an effort to reach out to Matt and to Bernie to let them know that this topic has been added um, and uh, make sure that everybody has the, um, what was distributed. I think I already may have sent that out of what was distributed last night's meeting. I'll make sure that it was to the um, resident members and then uh, invite questions and I'll let you try and bring Bernie and Matt back up to speed on this next issue. Next issue. Uh, do you know when we'll be receiving the audit? Because that's usually helpful to have the ability to look at it in advance. Yeah, I think we have it. So we can post, I'll, uh, I'll send an email out, but I think we can mm -hmm. post the audit and the OPEP report in the packet um, probably tomorrow. I think I saw the packet was posted, so we can get that put in tomorrow. Okay, so, um, and uh, I can't bring forward any minutes on my part. Um, there are some minutes that were distributed, and I would encourage her, given the fact that we're, uh, this has been a drag, is to try and uh, bring them up to date uh, for um, others to take a look at them too. Just look at the minutes. If you think that there are significant ch changes, uh, then send me an email so that we can figure out how to deal with it. If not, uh, just be prepared to make suggestions uh, so that we have them for next meeting. You can just can try and move some of those along. So, um, anything else, Kathy? I was just going to say, I looked at the minutes that were in this packet and they looked great. So I will be prepared to just try to move them next time. They, they were one one set of minutes. Um, that's it. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to prolong to not today's meeting. I'm, I'm willing to get them off our list, though, <laughs> next week, next time we meet. Okay. Let's see what we can, how much we can move along. Uh, so anything else that somebody wants to raise that was not anticipated? Seeing none, then I think that we are adjourned at five minutes after five. Thank you. It's been a uh, very productive, but difficult, but productive meeting and uh, appreciate everybody's participation. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.